Do not watch this video if you're anime only. I repeat, if you haven't read the manhwa and don't want to be spoiled, click away now since there most definitely will be spoilers here. Now, for those of you still with me, this is to put it simply the record of Sung Jin Woo's struggles. It's every level up he's ever experienced, every ability and skill he's ever earned, and every weapon he's ever laid his hands on. It's a recount of how it is he became the strongest monarch in existence, alongside an in-depth explanation of all the tools that helped him get there. This doesn't just include the events depicted in the manhwa, but also tries to include as much from the novels too. That way if you're someone who's read the manhwa, there might still be some other details worth sticking around for. So, as we go through the evidence of Sung's resistance and the reward for all his suffering, hopefully by the end you'll be able to get an idea of just how strong he is. Okay. As strong as Sung jin -woo becomes at the end of the series, none of it would have been possible if not for the system the Architect bestowed upon him. This is the very tool that enables his leveling, and it's the sole reason his body is capable of handling the powers of the Shadow Monarch. What serves as the foundation for all that though is the five core attributes Sung had spent his entire journey improving. The key stats defining his power, all of which enhance him exponentially the more he levels them. So, if we're going to understand how strong Sung jin -woo is, we first need to understand what it is these attributes do for him. Strength increases all his physical stats, and that in turn translates to hitting harder and moving faster. Agility allows him to see faster, and that in turn translates to an improved reaction time. Sung likes to describe it as time itself slowing down for him, but in actuality it was him just perceiving things faster. The more he enhanced it, the slower things would appear to him, and by the end of the story time would just seem frozen. He could literally split milliseconds and react to the moments between them. Next we have Vitality, and that increased both his HP and his stamina. They were two essential elements that made him tankier and less likely to hit the fatigue limit. Intelligence only increased his mana, but this would be the fuel allowing him to summon and revive his soldiers infinitely. Finally there's Perception which enhances his physical senses, and this is what Sung described as crucial information being transmitted in the form of sensation and feeling. He could sense auras and perceive the very flow of mana, and that in turn meant he could literally see how strong someone was. Eventually not even needing to see them, since the more perception was refined, the farther he could sense people's auras. So much so that if someone had tried to run across the globe, he could instantly pinpoint where on earth they vanished to. Now that you know what it is these attributes do, we can start from the very beginning when all of them were simply at 10. Sung had just been entered into the system, and the penalty quest resulted in him gaining his first passive and active skill. Skills were the abilities he would pick up from experience or runestones, and just like himself, they too could level up the more experience he got with them. They unfortunately maxed out at a level of 3, but it was after that that they could be upgraded into their ultimate versions. So long as the user kept becoming more proficient with them, they would eventually upgrade again into the most refined and effective versions of themselves. For now he just had tenacity and dash, but both over time would become more and more powerful. Now, tenacity was a passive that halved incoming damage whenever his health dropped below 30%, and more times than not this would be the sole reason for his survival during a very tough boss fight. Dash enhanced movement speed by 30%, and this too would be a nice bit of utility he would get quite a bit of use out of. Whether it be evading enemies or closing the gap between them, there was no downside for being able to do those things faster. Fast forward to the dungeon in the subway, and this would bring us to Sung's very first level up. He would equip Kim's sword to enhance his attacks, then use it to kill Lycans until there were no Lycans left. 20 plus Lycans would bring him to level 7, and the reward for that was a title calling him Wolf Slayer. It was a buff that only applied when the title was equipped, and what it did was increase all his stats by 40% when fighting against beast type monsters. Eight more levels would be gained while farming the two main floors of the subway dungeon, and another two after killing Kasuka on the third. This brings him to level 17 now, and it's also the point where he gets his first real weapon. Kasuka's Fang which improves attack and can afflict both bleed and paralysis. Bleed decreases the target's health 1% a second, and paralysis renders a target unable to move for a bit. They were both effects that were put to good use against Wang's group. One more level would be gained after killing the golem from the dungeon break, and another three again after defeating the C-rank spider boss. This brings us to level 21, and I'm sure you know that's when Sung has to complete the emergency quest. The reward for which was a brand new skill called Bloodlust. 
This imbues the effect of fear onto a target or multiple targets, and what it does is decrease the stats of those afflicted by it by 50%. It only lasts for a minute in total, but for the intense aura it emanates that's usually enough for Sung to get whatever he wants out of it. It's a bit after this that Sung would ingest Kasuka's poison, and that would be the first of many physical damage reductions he would gain. This one was mostly in part to Kandiaru's blessing, which was a permanent effect making him immune to all poisons, diseases, and debuffs. The tower dungeon brings us to the boss with Cerberus, and it's the defeat of that which would grant him four more levels and his first equip item. The gatekeeper's necklace which improved both agility and perception. This did have to be worn in order for the bonus to take effect, but it did also disappear once on which made wearing them a whole lot easier. Now, another level would be gained after killing the hobgoblin boss from the Kang dungeon, then another one after that for hunting down all its underlings. It was immediately after having defeated Kang though that the reward for that was a runestone bearing the stealth skill. As the hidden skill which made this fight harder than it should have been, had it not been for Sung's perception which let him track Kang's every movement, Sung knew for sure he would have been killed by him. Luckily he didn't even need his eyes since at this point his perception was high enough to know where he was without even looking at him. It was another use for this stat aside from knowing whether or not to fight someone. The primary reason he'd been putting any points into the stat at all. By making this stealth his own skill now though, he too could cloak his body and hide every single trace of it making it easy to approach enemies without being seen or perhaps just teleport in public without anyone noticing. The latter was more of a joint synergy with Shadow Exchange, so that's something we won't see until later. Now, with Sung being level 27, this would be the point where he would start doing the 19C rank raids with Jinho. The first day had granted him one level, two new skills, and a skill upgrade, then the second another three levels since the new skills were so incredibly useful. You see, Dash had improved to level 2 and that alone increased its buff from 30% to 40%. It was a huge jump that went to make Sung even faster now. The passive skill was called Advanced Dagger Technique and this was earned after having fought with a dagger for so long. It was a reward for his ever increasing proficiency with it and as such provided 33% increased damage whenever he was using one. This also came with the brand new active skill Critical Attack, and this simply made it easier for Sung to target his opponent's vitals. It provided the most optimum way to attack with his daggers, and as such would guide him to the weak spot most lethal to them, after which additional damage would be applied if the weak spot was hit. That may sound standard given our own perception of critical attacks in video games, but for Sung this was a lot bigger than any of us may have considered. What I mean is that, for him who'd just been mindlessly slashing in hopes of landing a hit, a clear path to maximum damage was literally game-changing. Before he'd only ever achieved it a couple of times, but it's when he did that he knew the fight was over. Like with Kang in this dungeon or the monsters here, Sung knew the moment his dagger made impact the fight was finished. There was this satisfying feeling which made him certain of it. So to be able to achieve that feeling with every attack, well, that was kind of like finding water in the desert. It had turned Sung into a monster killing machine, essentially buffing his efficiency to the point that it was practically tripled now. By the fourth day, Sung and Jinho would have completed 9C rank gates, and it was at this point that Sung was level 39 now. One more would be gained while in a dungeon fighting against lizardmen, and this would unlock access into the class change dungeon. An area where two more levels would be gained while fighting assassins and knights, then three more across the span of six hours while getting to Igris. The knights he killed dropped some of the best equipment he'd come across yet, and the end result was a Sung who was pretty kitted now. Unfortunately, the gloves, ring, and shoes didn't specify what they did, but the breastplate and gauntlets both added another 10% physical damage reduction together. It also helped that the gauntlets prevented any injuries to the wearer's hands an additional effect that would come in handy when fighting Igris. Once again, these armor pieces didn't actually hinder him since the instant they were equipped, they would vanish as if not even there anymore. They did encumber him if a stat wasn't above a certain level, but that was a growth issue Sung never had to worry about. Two more levels would be gained after defeating Igris, then another four while farming centipedes during the penalty quest. This had also brought Critical Attack to level 2, and that in turn increased the damage done when a weak spot was hit. More importantly than all that though was the first S rank item Sung had earned as a drop from Igris. It didn't have an effect that made it anything particularly special, but the stats it gave were by far the best out of any of his equipment. 
I mean, the 15% physical damage reduction alone made it top tier already, then those additional 40 stat points just made it better. It was as if the Gatekeeper's Necklace and Kasuka's Poison were combined into one. So, with that bringing his stats to this, Sung was ecstatic from all the massive boosts he'd just received. In fact, it was actually a core part of making the centipede farming that much easier for him. The gold he got from that was then used to purchase Night Killer, and this would be the dagger Sung would stick with until the Red Gate. It was much stronger than Kasuka's since it tripled the damage it did, and it also came with the effect of doing 25% more damage to heavily armored opponents. Sung did consider using both daggers, but to him he felt that would be way too cumbersome. Like, if he wanted to retain mobility and remain flexible in combat, then Sung knew he needed to keep his left hand open. Now, it was shortly after that that Sung would finally activate the runestone he got from Igris. A new active skill called Ruler's Touch, which at its core allowed him to physically manipulate objects without ever touching them. It was pretty much telekinesis, and the extent to which it worked depended of course on how proficient he was with it. So right now if he wanted to move something a whole lot bigger than him, he wouldn't be able to since he wasn't skilled enough yet. That quickly changed over time though, since even when Sung wasn't in combat, he would constantly use Ruler's Touch on the small objects around him, always increasing his proficiency in hopes of eventually getting to that ultimate version. Sure, it was a little bit tiring, but when considering what could be done when the limiters were off, a mild headache was definitely worth it. So, from his dagger to orcs to the Demon King himself, Sung would become capable of influencing them all. He had even started to become creative with it, and would occasionally use it on himself to move or dodge while airborne. Going back to the class change dungeon now, after killing a mage by throwing his dagger, Sung had earned himself another active skill called Dagger Throw. This increased his damage whenever a dagger was thrown and would become more accurate the more proficient he was with it. A neat synergy he found with his ruler's touch skill was that by applying it to his dagger whenever it was thrown, he could increase its momentum and make it do even more damage. So, that was all directly on the path to becoming a necromancer, and as we know that was simply a means to promote him to Shadow Monarch, an upgrade that would unlock two skills, a title, and a whole bunch of bonus stats. His new title gave him a 1% stat increase for every 1% health he was missing, and he would keep it equipped unless he knew he was going up against beast-type monsters. His skills were all related to his class, and they were the abilities to create shadow soldiers and store them. Shadow Extraction creates soldiers by extracting mana from a recently deceased target, while Shadow Storage allowed them to be stored within his shadow. They could then be summoned freely at zero cost to him, then absorbed back whenever he wanted. The number he could store was always less than the number he could extract, but if there was ever a time when a battlefield was riddled with targets for Shadow Extraction, those extra numbers would certainly make a difference, even if they were only going to be present for that battle specifically. The extras would all be returned to the Void once the battle was finished, since their existence was after all only possible when in the vicinity of him. Now, Song's level would be 51 after finishing the class change quest, and the next level after that would come from the Red Gate. One for killing the first ice bear in the forest, another for farming the rest of them in their own natural habitat, then two more for defeating Baraka. Five more would be rewarded in between all that, but all in all nine were gained from the Red Gate. The reward for beating Baraka was his dagger, and as a weapon with stats higher than even Night Killer, it was a good candidate to be his primary now. It had even been imbued with weight reduction magic, and that in turn allowed Sung to become even more agile with it. At this point, Sung would be level 60, and the monsters he'd been farming with Jinho in the C rank dungeons now felt no stronger than the goblins he once fought in the E rank dungeons. By the time all 19 raids were completed, Sung would have brought himself up to level 61 now. This now brings us back to the Demon Castle, and it's here where a large majority of Sung's power leveling will happen. 27 floors in would bring him up to level 67, then at floor 50 he would be level 69. Each demon he killed gave varying amounts of XP, but for now the mid-ranked ones were something like 300 apiece. Now, two more levels would be gained after killing Vulcan, and along with it, the Beat of Avarice and the first piece of the Demon Monarch set. This was another S rank equip item, and in addition to plus 20 endurance and plus 20 stamina, equipping the entire set came with a bonus. Plus 5 to all stats when 2 were equipped, then plus 10 for all 3. Eventually level 70 would be passed as well, and somewhere between then and his fight with Metis, Sung would unlock his new class skill Monarch's Domain. 
It was an AoE buff that enhanced his Shadow Soldier stats by 50%. As long as they were fighting within his shadow, then this buff would remain active permanently. Another two levels would be gained after beating Metis, and the reward for that was the second piece of the Demon Monarch set, an s rank necklace which would finally replace the Gatekeeper one. By now, Sung was level 77, and his next level up wouldn't happen until the raid with the Hunter's Guild. One level would be gained while stealth killing the orcs, another when fighting the main army of orcs, then one more for killing their leader. It had brought us to level 80 and back to floor 76 of the Demon Castle. Leveling had become a lot more efficient now, since Tusk equipped with the Beat of Avarice essentially made each floor nothing but a demon farm. Each enemy he vaporized was around 2000 XP, and the best part was that Sung didn't even need to fight them. He would gain two levels just by sitting there and doing nothing. Sung would go on to take this another step further and command six squads of 20 to split up and kill everything. It was the epitome of what we would call power leveling, and it had turned the entire floor into his own personal XP farm, granting him another two levels before proceeding to the next. Three more would be gained while getting to floor 80, then another four when he finally reached above floor 90. At 97, he was level 93, then defeating the Demon King brought him up to level 97 himself. This in turn came with the plethora of rewards, but the most important was a runestone bearing the Shadow Exchange skill. This allowed him to switch locations with any of his shadows, but it could only be done once every three hours right now. The process itself just sucked him into his own shadow, then the darkness would spit him out exactly where he wanted. It was a truly instantaneous method of teleportation, since even with Sung using perception to slow time down, the whole thing was still just a blink of the eye to him. A brief sensation of falling followed by a just as brief sensation of being lifted. The other reward was the final piece of the Demon Monarch set, then the Demon King's short sword and the Demon King's long sword. The former would become Sung's primary weapon, since in addition to an already stacked base attack, its innate effect added the user's strength stat to the base attack's total, a result that was four times stronger than that of the previous dagger. The long sword came with the effect of Tempest Flames, and that was an AoE attack that summoned a localized persistent lightning storm. So, these daggers would play a vital role in getting the two levels from defeating Beru, then the longsword was what granted him that one final level to get to 100. He had used the Tempest attack to destroy all the Antags, and it was the XP from that which leveled him up. His fight with Beru had also upgraded Critical Attack into Mutilate, and this would be the ultimate version which crit multiple times. You see, not only did it seek out every vulnerability possible, but it also hit all of them with maximum efficiency. Every weak spot was struck one after the other, all in a streak that seemed almost instant. It was a series of attacks powerful enough to shred even the strongest of enemies. Level 101 was achieved during the raid with Wu, and it was from this that all his class skills would become better. They had each upgraded to level 2, and for most that came with a rather significant effect buff. Shadow Extract now had a chance to enhance a soldier upon extraction, and Shadow Storage now came with shared sensory perception. Both very useful in improving his shadow army, but that shared sensory perception had a lot more utility to it. He no longer had to teleport to do a bit of recon, since wherever a shadow was he could simply experience the world through them. As for his other skills, most if not all were max level or in their ultimate form. Dash had now become Quicksilver, Critical Attack into Mutilate, Dagger Throw into Dagger Rush, then Advanced Dagger Technique into Master of Daggers. The first three all just improved on what the initial skill did, but it was Master of Daggers which made Sung an absolute monster with them now. The weapon was pretty much an extension of his arm, and he could control both just as precisely as his own fingers. He had an absolute mastery over every technique one could possibly come up with for them. Ruler's Touch didn't upgrade until his fight in the double dungeon, but it was when it did that the force it applied increased exponentially. So much so that the Statue of God, Thomas Andre, and even the other monarchs would fall victim to it. The full extent of its power becomes clear when Sung becomes the fully fledged Shadow Monarch, but to put things plainly, it's pretty much highly advanced mana manipulation. Whenever something's being influenced by this skill, it's actually just Sung using mana to take control of it. Mana's dispersed from the surrounding air, and it's then wrapped around whatever object Sung wants to manipulate. That object would then be caught in a strong field of magical energy, and it would only move if Sung wanted it to. He can also reinforce it to the point it becomes this invisible armor, or channel it together to create some sort of mana sword. All in all, he can pretty much manipulate mana into anything he wants now. 
It's not something we'll see until the end of the series though, so for now he's more just learning how to do all that. The effect of the Demon Hunter title would be gained after the Double Dungeon too, and this would provide the Black Heart which was pretty much his infinite mana source. It was enough to turn his Army of Shadows into a truly immortal one. So, as the first step towards truly becoming the Sovereign of Shadows, all of Sung's attributes felt as if they were overflowing now. It wasn't just his overwhelming mana since his vitality too felt like it was amplified. Sung would still continue to level though since after completing every high ranking dungeon for an entire week straight, he had gained 2 levels and was 103 now. 6 more were gained from the 13 giants he killed on the way to Tokyo, then another 3 against even more of them. 4 were gained from the giant skyscraper 1 guarding the gate, then another 8 after killing the monarch of giants. This would bring him to level 122, and the equipment he has now is the demon set, the Red Knight's Helm, and the Truth Seeker set. A new set of armor he had purchased from the system shop. We don't know what it is they do, but I would imagine it had a part in making his physical damage reduction 65% now. 11 more levels would be gained after clearing Japan of all its monsters, then another 13 from his final fight with the Plague Monarch. They were levels that came from his soldiers wiping out an entire country's worth of monsters, so I'm sure you can imagine just how long that would have taken had Sung tried to do it himself. It was between all that though that Thomas Andre would give him the Kamish Daggers. His endgame weapons since one alone had more damage than even the most expensive shop item. Combine this with its ability to get stronger when wielded by someone with enhanced mana, and what you have are some heavy duty weapons capable of slicing through anything. In fact, when compared to the last ones which barely scratched the highly defensive tree monsters, these could slice right through them no problem. They were multiples stronger than even Beru's attacks since he too was incapable of cutting down those tree monsters. The weight of the daggers could also be manipulated, so that's an additional benefit making them far more agile. Now, I'd like to say Sung did get stronger after dying and becoming one with the Shadow Monarch, but in actuality that power was always within him even before that. Yes, all the limiters hindering his shadows and restricting his skills did come off, but in terms of raw power, it was already up there with Ashborn's even before him getting killed. His body was already a strong enough vassal to handle the powers of death and everything that came with it. He just didn't know it. So, as a true replacement for the Monarch of Shadows, Sung's power had essentially become complete. He had become the strongest monarch and was fully capable of everything Ashborn once was. This included control over the power of death, and effectively made him an immortal deity that lived outside the boundaries of time. That's not to say he couldn't be killed, but if he was, who knows how long he'll actually stay dead for. Consider it one of the perks of having authority over death itself. It is a bit of a stretch to call him a straight up god, since his powers are only omnipotent within the realm of death. There he has absolute control over literally everything, but outside that territory he's neither omnipotent nor omniscient. He can only use the powers of death to do stuff like this. He has mana to support a 10 million shadow army, can use ruler's authority to lift the entire United States army, is strong enough to punch faster than the speed of light, and can affect the planet with just his mere presence. The full extent of all this was never made clear, but at this point we can only compare him to the absolute being. Someone he might even be stronger than now. But yeah, that's every level up skill and item that goes towards making Sung Janu him. He does also have the Dragon Fear AoE stun skill, but that was a one-time use against the Dragon Emperor's army. So I hope all this was helpful in highlighting just how strong he is. It's a bit longer than what I usually do, but that's just how much was needed to get through all of it. Alright, so yeah, Mugen's a little project myself and a few others have been tirelessly working on lately. Our goal is to create a community around anime-inspired fashion and release products that cater to more niche anime like a lot of the isekai I talk about. Our first is the level up collection, and each piece within has been carefully crafted and designed by us. There's the three t-shirts each made of 100% cotton and designed for that loose streetwear vibe, then there's the pullover hoodie again made with heavy cotton but also lined on the inside for a more comfy feel. The hat will be a standard part of every collection, but we did add a little something to the back to indicate which collection it is from. They're all pieces that I'm personally proud to finally unveil to you, and it's the first step we're taking towards what I hope is something bigger. So, if you want to support us and what we're building, or just secure what's some pretty awesome streetwear, you can use the link in the description to pre-order yours today. Not only will every purchase go straight towards creating more collections inspired by other anime, but we'll also be dedicating a portion of each towards the Animator Dormitory project. It's a fund that supports animators in Japan directly. 
just remember the store will only be open for the next three weeks, after which the collection will be archived and production finally started. It's a process we estimate should only take six to eight weeks to get to your doorstep. Of course, depending on where you are in the world. But yeah, that's pretty much Mugen in a nutshell, and I hope you'll join me tomorrow to see these products in person. I'll be giving away a couple to anyone who comes by and follows our socials. But anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!